Okay, so nice. We have this first joint seminar. I'm really happy to have here with us Jay Christopher. He's a PhD student about to defend an excellent PhD with excellent supervisors <laughs> uh, in Rome and, and UTC. Uh, he will talk about various economic perspectives on the de energy transition. Okay. So I give you the floor for not more than an hour. And I'm sure it will be funny. Uh, and, uh, and then the discussion, where are the discussants? We have two here. He's coming. There are so many of you. That's very exciting. Um, so as David said, I'm, I'm J. Christopher Proctor. I'm an EPUG alumni. So graduate, I did EPUG 2014 to 2016, which now seems a very long time ago. Uh, but we were many fewer people back then. So it's exciting to see how, how big it's gotten. Uh, yeah, and I've got an hour, so I'll jump into it. Economic perspectives on the energy transition. Uh, so as David said, this is more or less my, my PhD thesis that I'm getting very close to the end of. Uh, and so there will be, oh no, <laughs> there'll be quite a lot of things going on up there. It just goes back and forth. Yeah, so uh, I guess I've done a handful of EPUG seminars before uh, and done different things, talking about heterodox economics, energy things, and back and forth, and gotten feedback from the different cohorts. Uh, and so I'm going to try to do two very different things and then put them back together, uh, and, and we'll, we'll see how that goes. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the energy transition, so the problem that we face. Um, I think in this year in Paris, you will hear a lot about climate change, a lot about energy, a lot about these different problems. Um, but luckily it's September, so you're not sick and tired of this yet. So I can, I can still talk about that. Uh, and then similarly, I'm going to talk a little bit about heterodox economics. Uh, this is another one where many of you in the room are absolute experts on this and won't really have a lot, to, a lot more to add for this. But for some of you, uh, heterodox economics can still be a new thing, even in the first months of, of EPOG. Um, and so I think it's important at some point in your EPOG experience to kind of slow down and introduce what that is and, and what that's about. And then I'll try to put them together and think about how we can have different economic perspectives uh, tell us something about the energy transition. Uh, so the energy transition, what is it? Uh, and maybe just to say, I get accused of talking very quickly. So if I'm talking too fast or if you can't understand, just wave your arms and I can, I can go slower. Uh, so net zero by 2050 to contain the climate crisis. Um, so this is now a fairly old statistic. Um, but since uh, 2018, when the uh, IPCC published their report on 1.5 degree warming, uh, this became sort of the, the accepted knowledge or the, the stylized fact. Uh, and where this came from was that what the IPCC did was look at thousands of different scenarios run by these different climate models and say, okay, if every one of these little lines is a, a climate scenario, in the ones where we're able to achieve 1.5 or 2 degrees of warming, what are some of the common characteristics? Uh, and one of the things that almost is completely necessary is that the world hits uh, net zero carbon emissions sometime around 2050. Maybe to 2060, but really around 2050. So what, what exactly does that look like? And, and what, what is going to be required to meet that? So as I, I kind of had in the slides, I'm talking about the energy transition. So if we look at where emissions come from, uh, about 75% of them come from the energy sector. This is not to discount agriculture and industry, which are also really big problems. But at least for the literal problem of climate change from emissions, they're somewhat, they're somewhat separate. Um, and energy really is, is the big show here. Um, so what is the story that we have about energy transition? Um, sort of the, the big exciting news is that renewable energy is exploding. Uh, all around the world, the costs for renewable energy are, are dropping very rapidly. Uh, and the amount of deployed or uh, installed renewable capacity has been growing quite exponentially, really, quite, quite in incredible rates. Um, and so I, I put together this graph a few years ago now showing the, the change in the growth rate here. Because it feels like renewable energy has been a big deal. It's been a thing that's coming for a very long time now. Um, but there really has been a change. Uh, and so from 2020, uh, to the year 2000 to 2010 in the United States, we had about a doubling of the amount of solar energy that we had. 
Uh, and since 2010, when I started studying economics in university, uh, it's grown by about 90 times. Um, so really just absolutely a, a completely new system of solar energy has been built. Um, and that slide is even a little bit old, and it's now increased by another 30% uh, just since last year when I was putting this together. Um, so there are these really big increases in renewable energy uh, deployment. The problem is that this new energy is also going together with new demand, and new demand for energy. So we have this story that we, we tell about humans' energy use, where we used to rely on animals and, and wood power and traditional biomass, and that was really where our energy came from. And that's sort of this big, thick red, down, red line down at the bottom. And then in the industrial era, we found coal, and we started burning all this coal and released all of this energy. Then at some point, we transitioned to oil, and then at some point, gas becomes a big deal. Um, but really, the, the thing we don't tell in that story is that the older forms of energy never go away. Uh, we still use just as much traditional biomass now as we ever did. Uh, the coal has only gotten bigger. Oil only gotten bigger. Um, and so what we've been doing is increasing the amount of energy demand and then adding new sources. Uh, and so that's more or less the story with what's happening with renewables, is that they are growing very quickly, um, but in some sense they're only just filling the new demand that's also being created. Um, so I just wanted to kind of put on a graph some lines here of what does net zero by 2050 look like. And it's something like this, where we have to say, here's our non-carbon intensive forms of energy, and here's everything else, and we need to have this come all the way down to zero. Um, just to see it on a graph um, with 1800 there for the kind of scale uh, of what we're talking about. Um, but of course here I have the line for energy demand flat um, and that might not be the world we're living in. And so if you say we're going to have about the same growth rate going forward and have to do this, this is the gap that we're talking about filling uh, with an energy transition. Um, so that's a visual representation of the task. Um, I had a couple more slides. So just to, again, the, the growth rates. Um, earlier I was showing the sort of very intense growth rates we've had already. This is those growth rates now for the world level, but on the same graph, with an uh, estimate from the International Energy Agency of the amount of solar we'll need to be adding each year by 2030. Um, so just to say, even our very ambitious growth rates now look quite pathetic compared to the, the levels that are needed. Is there a question in the front? Yeah, yeah just uh, can you go back and the like, Yeah, this one. So, like, if I were to work, just uh, yeah. like, the traditional mass <laughs> for oil and gas would need to like, drop out to zero. Also, the traditional biomass. Depends. Uh, yeah. Much that, that one's sort of more complicated because it depends how it's created. But, yeah. but no, more or less it was coal, oil, and natural okay, gas, okay, that okay. sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. And about energy generation, so you're touching up on energy consumption, anything about energy generation? Uh, this was also generation. So this is where the, the energy is coming from um, in terms of, yeah, the, the kind of core generation technologies. Then there's different questions about how it's used if it's going into electricity or directly into fuels, but that's kind of complications at that point. Um, no, but just to kind of fly through these here at the end, um, one, one comparison I thought was quite useful. So uh, the emissions we know are still going up, but we had this weird COVID blip for a year or so where emissions actually went down. Uh, and if you take the, the rate of decline from COVID, from the COVID years, and project that out, it's almost the same slope that we would need to reach net zero by 2050. Um, so just for a scale of the kind of change we need every year would be roughly the kind of emission reductions that we saw during COVID. Um, and, and so, of course, there's like more pleasant ways to do that than all staying inside. But even to say that having everyone stay inside for a year only was sort of a one-time thing, I would say that would not have been kept going down. Um, and so there, there's really this big task that's needed. Um, and that's, that's kind of the conclusion of this section. And not to be too pessimistic here, but, but it is really just a... What? No, no, it, it's sort of... Uh, it, it's, wow, there are so many epoggers. This is great. Um, so you're, you're right in time. Um, I'll let everyone sit down. No, but, but not to say that the task is impossible or that we're, we're doomed to failure, but just to say... It is really a historically unprecedented task. It's a really big thing that we're, we're planning to do. Um, 
While everybody's, oh well, I guess I've got a couple more slides. Um, so well, how do we, how, as scientists and as economists, how do we go about thinking about this task? How do we try to say, okay, there's this gigantic gap that we need to fill, what are the things we need to do? One of the main tools that we use is quantitative modeling. Um, so climate economy models are, are a tool that we use to help understand some of these options. Uh, and so within this world, there's a type of model called integrated assessment models. Um, and literally what these are is any kind of model that combines a representation of the economy and a representation of the Earth's climate systems. Uh, so if you have your economic model and then you say, okay, this is related with some amount of CO2 emissions, and those CO2 emissions are related with some amount of damage to the economy, that is now an integrated assessment model because you have integrated in uh, the climate system. But most of these models are much, much, much bigger than just the simple link. Uh, and so it's quite common now to have models that have land systems, water systems, biodiversity systems, uh, all, ev basically every process that you could try to hire a team of scientists to build a model for and then link them all together, that has become the project. Uh, and so these models are gigantic, you have hundreds of people working on them, uh, and there's maybe 20 or 30 major ones in the world, something like that, and then some smaller ones. Um, but just for kind of a scale of, of what, what this environment looks like. Um, and <laughs> yeah, that's good. And so it's good timing to get everybody in the room. Um, so what we're going to do now is stop for about 10 minutes and try to actually play with one of these climate models. Um, so hopefully in one of your group chats, someone sent a link. Uh, there's a model called En-ROADS. You can see it really tiny here. It's E-N-R-O-A-D-S. Um, you can just Google it and it pops right up. Um, and I, I can write it, but I hate chalk. The link is on EPUBG to Max sent it. Perfect. There, there should be a link sent everywhere. Um, and so what we're going to do is get into groups of about four. Um, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll try to do this quickly. There's so many. But basically, don't, don't think too much. Just come into groups with people around you. Um, and what we're going to do is I'm going to give each of your group an institution or an organization that you have to represent. Uh, and you're then going to use this model to try to create a scenario that would be good for your organization. Um, so let's say, for instance, your organization was um, the Macron government in France. Um, you might start thinking, OK, we, we care about climate, but we don't care too much about climate because we still need some, some jobs, and, and, and try to balance these things. Um, the trick is that I want you to try to use as few of the policy variables as possible. So this model has hundreds of different variables and levers you can pull to change things. But I want you to try to really think, what are the core things for your institution that matter the most? Um, and then build your scenarios and, and you can kind of see. We're going to try to do this in about 10 minutes and then we'll come back and talk about climate modeling a little more. Um, so I'll give you 30 seconds to get your groups together, make clear what your group is, and I'll come and give you an institution. <laughs> You can be bigger if you need to, it's okay. Just as long as you can hear each other. Are you guys a group? Okay, okay the Donald Trump re-election campaign. Donald Trump 2024. Do I have a group here? Okay, for Fridays for Future. Do I have a group here? The EPOG Alumni Association. Do I have a group in the back? Groups? Okay. The city of Paris. Is there a group here that... You're not the same group as them, right? Okay. Uh, you're the Lula government in Brazil. You are the uh, French Labor Union Association. Do I have a group in the back? You are OPEC, Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries. We can't, we can't, we can't, we can't. That's right. Ah, yes. Do I have someone here? Yes. The European Commission. The European. Do I have a group here? Uh, the Association of European Farmers. Did, 
Sorry? Did you guys get it one yet? Um, European Nature Preservation Society. I don't know if that's a real thing, but something like that. Did you guys get one? No, 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 no. We haven't. We haven't. You don't have one yet. Um, ECLA. The South Americans can explain. That's <laughs> Should be right on track. Yes. What? Sorry? Yours isn't working. It's a browser problem. Your, your browser isn't supported. The others seem to be working. Yeah. We can say try with another computer. You should be able to move all the bars. <laughs> you gotta do something, right? Make sure. Okay. <laughs> OPEC is five degrees back there. <laughs> You didn't get an institution. Um, the Joe Biden re-election campaign. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I think I'll give them until 30. And then um, I should be able to go until like 2 10, 3 10 if I do a full hour. Okay. Now we should be like go on 1.5 because now that's the goal, right? Who are you representing? The European Commission. Our goal is 1.5. Nuclear energy is not. If you really think the European Commission wants to hit 1.5, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I've ne for them? <laughs> no, the official goal is two degrees with an effort, with a, a hope, an attempt. Uh, <laughs> if you can get to 1.5, that's great. That's <laughs> no, but that's the question. Like, what is your goal? No, but if you can let me know when there's about 20 minutes left. Uh, just because no one's keeping time for me, so... What? Yeah, something like that. 250? Yeah, so with 20 minutes left. Maybe just to interrupt you to say, if you haven't already, check the extra settings. If you click the three little dots, there's extra variables you can play with. So the, the three dots on each policy, 
And then up here, there's different graphs that you can graph as well. So you can see the impact on different variables. <laughs> Just make sure everyone got it all. You what? There's supposed to be more settings? Sorry? There's supposed to be more settings or did we get to If you click on the three dots next to each of the policies, it's down here. So like for deforestation, now you can see the details of what that actually means. The actual models behind these are very crazy. The amount of things that they have to like... Wow. <laughs> it's hard not to admire them a little. <laughs> My book! <laughs> oh, my God. Sure, I even bought a thing. Oh. I think we'll go for about one more minute and then come back. <laughs> Someone's getting some water. <laughs> Yeah, I think we can go ahead and get, get started again. So, uh... <laughs> so that's a climate model. Um, yeah, so go ahead and go back to this a while and then I'll let you, well, we'll see how much time we have. Um, but, uh, but yes, so climate integrated assessment modeling. What you were playing with was the user interface for an integrated assessment model. Um, so this is a, a quite a big sophisticated one that comes from MIT in the US. Um, and it's actually a, one of the better ones, I think, because well, we'll kind of get into it, but it's much more flexible than a lot of the others. Um, and so it's, it allows you to do a lot more things. Um, and so if you started playing with the settings, where you have the, uh, the three dots here, you can see there's really quite a degree of control you can go into for building these, these different scenarios. Um, and then we didn't play with it, but we'll do this later if we have some time. If you go under simulation, there's an option for assumptions. Uh, and there's a whole list of different assumptions behind the model. Um, and so what you're doing is you're changing all the parameters that go into setting the model, um, which is quite exciting. Um, so in the paper that I, I sent around for this, I, I tried to make this comparison of um, these climate economy models being a form of science fiction. Um, and so what we're really trying to do with these models is to tell a coherent story of the world's technical, social, economic, and environmental developments to the end of the century, um, which is kind of an insane thing to try to do. But that is the, the task that I showed in the first slides. It's what well, we have to try, at least. Uh, and so within this, there's two different, two different parts. The first is the building of the structure of the model itself. Um, and so this is in the science fiction metaphor, the, the world building, sort of setting the stage. Who are the, who are the characters? How do things work? Is there magic in this world? Can people fly? What, what, are the, what is the world you're living in? And then there's the scenario design, and this is telling the story. Uh, so right now, what your groups were doing was really just playing with scenario design. You couldn't change the actual inner relations in the model itself. So if you say deforestation goes up, that does one thing in the model. It's, there's an exact relationship, but you are not able to actually change what that relationship is. Um, and so, of course, as, as economists, this is the more exciting part in some sense. There's a lot of interesting work that still needs to be done with scenarios and with telling more interesting stories, um, but really the, the kind of contribution that we as economists can have is to try to work on this world building, these, uh, building these models. Um, and so there's, there's in the, the, the latest IPCC report, the, the 2023 monster report, they actually do quite a good job of listing a lot of the criticisms of these integrated assessment models. Um, and so again, this is a list coming from the IPCC itself, not necessarily from angry heterodox economists. Um, but the, the, the sort of broad strokes here is that there's a lot of problems with missing or incomplete assumptions. Um, so basically anything relating to technology within these models can be challenged. Um, how does nuclear power work? Is there going to be direct air capture of carbon at some point in the model? Um, how, how expensive will solar power be? Will it keep declining at the same rate forever? Will it stabilize? Like, 
some are like, yeah, there's some real questions that go into the building of the models. Um, and, and basically everything can be fought about <laughs> in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of that. Uh, the second big complication here, or the big, uh, I guess, problem is how overly complicated the models are. Um, so you just saw how many different sliding bars you had, maybe 20 or 30. And then under each of those in the settings, there was another 10 or 20 policy options. And this is sort of the, the, the friendly climate model for kids, in a sense, like the one they build for educational purposes. Uh, so like the degree, the, the number of things that are being changed in each scenario is so massive that it's very difficult to tell where, what is actually producing the results, what, what is driving this. Um, and to the point that even the climate modelers themselves don't know, it's not like we're trying to hide something, but it's really like you build such a giant contraption that it's difficult to follow things through it and understand what's going on. Um, but the third and fourth uh, criticisms here are the ones that I think are quite interesting for us as economists. Uh, and the third here is the lack of social and institutional factors. Um, so you may have seen on your sliding bars, there is a lot of technology. Uh, there is a lot of outputs, things like deforestation, where like, okay, that's, that kind of comes from a process, but what was driving that process? Uh, but there was almost nothing about the economic system itself. Uh, there's the level of growth, and then that's about as far as you get. Uh, but things like inequality, ownership, control of resources, uh, geopolitics, all of these things are going to be core stories that uh, explain what happens in this transition, and they're, they're not in our existing models. Uh, and that's, it's quite strange because you can be very dramatic in the technological assumptions in these models. Um, and some of the models basically say at some point we'll be able to freely suck all of the CO2 from the air and, and trap it somewhere. It's like, okay, maybe. Um, but could we at least talk about maybe having a slightly different economic system? Like, but the, I guess the, the kind of takeaway here is that like, yes, we can, and we can build those models. And that's, that's a task that, that is ours now. Um, and the final thing here is less about the models themselves, but the way that they're used. Uh, that by using and showing these very complicated models, it closes the doors to unmodeled pathways. Uh, and so by not modeling something, by choosing not to model something, that doesn't have any statement on whether or not that thing is possible. It just says, we haven't modeled it. Um, but from a policy or an academic perspective, it, it can be quite a, yeah, quite a, a, a thing to say, no one has ever modeled this scenario. So ah, do you really want to try that as a policymaker? Um, and, and so this is really some, another thing for us to keep in mind about the, the politics and the use of these models. Um, so that is the end of section one on climate models. So the climate models of the 70s and the early 80s, they were very, the famous ones which were very accurate in predicting temperature rise. So what did they do that they avoided these pitfalls and they got everything right? And why are we concerned about these now when the models from I, I, should, I should have been more precise when saying climate models that I mean climate economy models. Um, and, and so this is a very specific class of modeling. So on one sense, there is climate models, which project if we emit this much CO2, what will happen to the climate? And those have been very accurate until this year when the, the temperature has kind of gone a little bit crazier than we expected. Um, but generally, those have been very good. The question is, how much CO2 are we going to emit? Um, and that's much harder to model, right? That, that is the economic question. Um, and so I think that by that, that the sort of projections from the 70s and 80s did OK, because they were able to just project a status quo. And our problem now is we are trying, at least, to change the status quo. And there's many different ways that we could do that um, or not do that. And that's kind of the difficulty. Um, that's More or less. And, and actually, the, the limits to growth model, which is sort of one of the famous ones, was actually more concerned about physical pollutions. Um, that was sort of the climate was sort of I, not really there. It, it was kind of different, uh, similar dynamics, but not the same specifics. Um, but that's sort of parking the first energy transition, which we will come back to. But just to say a word about heterodox economics. Um, so again, I said in the preface, I think for a lot of you, you're here because you know EPOG has a lot of heterodox economics involved. Um, but at least for my year, there was a large majority, a large plurality of EPOG students 
who weren't so familiar with, with the different branches of heterodox economics. So I think it's useful to kind of take a step at the beginning and say, what is this? Um, so maybe just to start to say, it's been kind of a rough 10 or 15 years for orthodox economics. Uh, between climate change, the stock market crash, even the inflation and everything having to do with COVID, uh, a lot of the, the standard models just haven't been so good at, at really explaining uh, how to solve the problems that we have. Uh, and so one of the things that's been quite uh, interesting is that heterodox economics has really taken off in policy and, uh, yeah, in public policy and politicians and students. So within academia, within the textbooks, not so much. Uh, but if you ask what are the sort of politicians in charge of our countries talking about, some of the ideas are a little heterodox. Um, and so we, we kind of have this debate about when we talk about mainstream economics, do we mean literally just what do they teach in Harvard, or do we mean what, are, what is used in the world? I mean, is the Central Bank of England a mainstream institution? Uh, I don't know. Um, so just again, somebody wants in. Sure, you can come in. Um, so again, just to kind of quickly talk through uh, a couple core ideas in, in heterodox economics. Um, and so very often in heterodox economics, we talk about schools of thought. Um, and I think I was once described as an old institutionalist with Kolecki and training, working with Shroffians on ecological macroeconomics. Um, and, and that's the second most confusing thing, the different types of Keynesians. That's very, that, that'll take you a year to figure out. Um, but at least at the beginning, you can really cut through some of this and talk about ideas and talk about the concepts and what are some of the, the things that they believe that are different than what the neoclassical economics would believe. So I'll talk about four different categories, growth, work, money and embeddedness, um, and, and just outline a couple different things here. Um, so the, the first, and I think really the core, um, yeah, one of the core things that goes through basically all of the schools of heterodox economics is that the economy is almost always operating under capacity. Um, so in Keynesian economics, this is called effective demand. And the idea is that if the government introduces more demand into the economy, you will have more growth. Uh, there are other complications and issues with that, especially in developing countries where you can have currency problems or trade problems. Um, but at least a, as a first response, that there are people sitting around without jobs, there's machines that are not being used, there's natural resources not employed, and if the government wants to, it can put those things to work. And, and that sort of drives a lot of the policy conclusions from heterodox economics. Um, the second is that systems of innovation drive long-term growth. Um, so this is another one that sounds somewhat obvious, but it's in contrast to the idea that technology growth just sort of falls from the sky, is this mysterious thing that sort of keeps humanity going, that there's some percentage of technology growth that you can assume. Um, and, and this says, no, 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 this growth is, uh, technology is created through a process, it is produced. And there are really these production processes of knowledge and of information uh, that are very important and can be structured in different ways. Uh, and people from Torino know way more about that than I do. Um, in terms of money, there's sort of two different sides that are quite fun here. Uh, the first is that banks can create virtually unlimited amounts of money, and it's a big problem. So this is endogenous money theory, again, quite popular with the Keynesians, uh, that as you have a, a boom in the economy, banks want to lend more money because everything looks great, everyone's getting rich, and so you also have a huge influx in the amount of money in the economy, which can drive bubbles and speculation. and. Uh, when I was in EPOG, it was right in the middle of the, the aftermath of the crash, and so we were really excited about this stuff um, because we were, yeah, living in it. Um, the other side is that governments can also create virtually amount of unlimited amounts of money, and this could be part of a solution. Um, so again, this is coupled with this idea of effective demand, but saying that governments can pay for anything they want, at least in their own country. If, you, if someone's willing to accept your currency, you can sell things. Again, if someone's willing to accept your currency can be a big problem in some contexts, but in others, not so much. In the Europe, in the US at least, it's quite a big, um, yeah, quite a big power that could be used uh, if we wanted. And then a handful of different ideas about work. Um, and so ownership and power shape the economy. This is sort of a basic one, and, and uh, some Marxists might get mad at the overcomplications here, but, but really this idea that who owns the, the means of production? Who owns the companies? Who owns the machines? Uh, and how that is controlled. Uh, that, that, the power behind that really is one of the core features of our economic system. Again, it could sound obvious, but in comparison with neoclassical economics, these things are not present whatsoever. Um, and so introducing power into the analysis is quite a big step for the heterodoxy. 
Um, the sixth here is that working with people is different than working with machines. Um, so this is really one of the big insights from feminist economics and the idea of care, care activities. Uh, that as economists, we want to think of everything as a pin factory in the 1700s. But the current service sector economy is just not like that in a lot of very fundamental ways. Um, from how productivity works, uh, if you're a teacher, you can't get more productive except by throwing more students in the classroom. Um, and, and that has some really big implications for, for economic growth and different cycles behind that. Um, and that's, that's a cool thing if anyone wants to really get into that. I like that one. Um, and then the, the seventh one here, economies function better when more people are involved in decision making. Um, and so from this, I'm really thinking of two very different strands of, of theory here of one, on one side, cooperative economics. Uh, so the idea that we have, there's very different ways you can organize production um, and that you can have systems in which the, the workers actually control the decision making process in their company and that in different aspects that can work much better. Um, it has its own problems. So you don't have the strict control of, an, of a, a company, um, but that there's, there's some benefits from that. Um, on the other side, I think there's actually some very interesting insights from Austrian economics, which goes a little crazy in the macroeconomics, but in some of the micro theories, they have a lot to think about how individual people know the most about their economic situation. And so the role of policy is to how we aggregate that information to be able to make the best decisions. They sort of take that and say, we need free markets to do this the best. But I think there is some, some interesting things to think about how knowledge is situated. Um, and, and especially for big problems like climate change, how can you use local knowledge and, and really make sure you're not, uh, yeah, not ignoring them. And then the last two, which are sort of the big picture uh, about the economy. The first is that there's no such thing as a free market. Um, so markets are embedded in institutions. They're created by laws. Uh, they are governed by states. Uh, this is sort of a very institutionalist economics uh, concept. Uh, and it's another one that could sound obvious, but really isn't, isn't so focused on in, in neoclassical economics. Uh, and then finally, the last one here, that economies must balance ecological and social constraints. Uh, and I think the word constraints here is the, the really important part here, because there's the idea that the economy is embedded in the biosphere. It's embedded in Earth's environment. And so it, from a very physical level, there are these hard physical boundaries that we have to respect eventually. Uh, and if you sort of start, take that as your starting point, you have a much different type of economics that you can come to. So going way too fast through all of this, but I still want to talk about climate change. Um, just to say, for anyone who's, who this was somewhat new and wants to learn more, if you want a bigger overview, there's a, a Rethinking Economics, an Introduction to Pluralist Economics. It's a very nice book. Um, it's not too long, and there's chapters on nine different schools of thought that you can look through. If you want a much smaller overview, there's the Oikos Guide to Pluralist Economics. Um, this is 20 pages with like two pages on each school of thought. Uh, and it's fun and illustrated. It's where all the memes come from. Uh, and, and so that's, that's a nice thing. And if you really just want one sentence overview, table three from the paper that I sent you has 17 concepts with one sentence. And it almost broke me trying to create this table. Um, but that, that can be quite useful as well. So. so. There's the pause. There's the end on, on heterodox economics. Um, and so I'm going to just kind of fly into the, the, the last part here, which is putting together economic perspectives, this heterodox economics with the energy transition. Um, and, and I will say again here, so this is more or less the structure of my, my PhD. I'm still in the process of writing it, but this is more or less what I've been doing is that I have this paper that I've sent you, which is Heterodox Economics and Energy Transition Models, where I go through and try to create some different scenarios and create different concepts using heterodox economics. And then I try to actually build my own model. Very small, very limited, but it's a nice model. And I try to try to recreate some of these stories. So that's that's the that's where we're going. I'm just trying. Hmm. So what I tried to do was think about potential contributions to integrated assessment modeling from heterodox schools of economic thought. In the end, I came up with 17 concepts. Uh, and I, for, for usefulness, assigned them to different schools of thought. But that really, if it helps you, that's good. If it confuses you, don't worry about the schools of thought. Um, and what I really did was I tried to make a much longer list of all the concepts I can think of from heterodox economics. And then I tried to come up with explicit examples of how this could be applied to a climate economy model. 
Uh, and there were a bunch that I couldn't think of anything. I was like, no way I could apply this. And so I dropped those off the list or combined them and kind of merged them back and forth. Um, but that's, that's where the list came from. And I've just talked through quite a few of these. I think all of the nine from the first presentation, from the other slides are in here somewhere. Um, but just to say you have sort of effect of demand, fundamental uncertainty, endogenous money, path dependency, well-being, power, institutional embeddedness, a, a lot of fun stuff kind of going on in here. Um, I then go through this giant table uh, and put all of them in one place. And then I tried to think of what are some qualitative energy transition scenarios or stories that we can come up with that are based on these different concepts. Um, and so what I was really doing here was just taking a handful of different concepts, slamming them together and say, if these were the main concepts that were driving the world economy for the next 100 years, what would that story look like? What would be the outcome from that? Um, and so just to talk through a few of these, so I have um, maybe an important detail as well. So in, in climate modeling, there's something called the shared socioeconomic pathways, which is like a common language for modelers, basically, common scenarios. And they're all named after roads. So there's like taking the highway, there's the green way, the, the divided way. So I tried to recreate that, but I think my, my names are better. Um, <laughs> and so I have the bumpy green boulevard. So this is my Green New Deal scenario, where you have effective demand. Governments really get into this and say, we know we can spend a lot of money. It's going to be great. We're going to have this, uh, this kind of this big boom. Uh, and they do, and they start really doing the transition. But they have problems with physical limitations. Um, so this is now the biophysical embeddedness. They start running out of energy availability. There's not enough energy for the machines to go, and they have to start having energy rationing. There's not enough lithium being produced each year to, to do all of this transition. And so you start having crashes in the computer sectors, and you start having these weird trade-offs that weren't really prepared for because they just assumed that supply was limitless. Um, and so really coming again, up against this biophysical problems, you have this sort of up and down. Again, it's not your worst case scenario. They are trying. Um, and, and in some ways, I think this is probably the closest to the world I see now. Um, they, are, they are kind of trying to do this with the tools available. Um, but you end up with problems. Um, can just talk through the others a little quicker. There, there's kind of nice paragraphs in the paper describing them. Um, but there's the slow and stable street. Um, so this is where you, you really have the idea of social metabolism. So the amount of, of energy and materials passing through the system. We try to reduce that. We try to go slower. We try to use less to, to consume less. Um, and in doing that, we try to also focus on well-being. We try to have this, uh, this idea that we're not just targeting GDP, but a broader measure of, of human well-being. Um, and this is good, but it leads to some problems in the financial sector. Because suddenly, all of these GDP levels are going down, but the, the treaties haven't changed, and the debt levels haven't changed. And so you, you start having these complications for public debt and for finance that you have to, you have to deal with. Um, I then have the science fiction freeway. And so this is my innovation super story, where we really focus on our innovation systems, and we get them just right, and have these crazy technologies that you could never have considered in 2023. Uh, and it changes everything. There's this creative destruction, this huge wave. Um, and it's, again, it's trying to think through something that is at least plausible. Um, and so that's, that's sort of one. Then the path to perdition. So this is the failure scenario where we, we keep on, we don't take climate change seriously, we don't take the other boundaries seriously, and our institutions start to fail. Uh, the states start to fall apart. Uh, families are not able to reproduce themselves, and you start having crashes in population. And, and really, the, the sort of things we take for granted as economists uh, really start to disappear. And this is, this is a bad, bad scenario, but you don't see so many of these, so it's, it's interesting to put it together. And then finally is the revolution. Uh, so this is where you have a massive economic revolution that changes everything in terms of ownership and distribution, but not necessarily in terms of the environment, because now the workers are in charge. And do the workers want to protect the environment or do they want to keep the economy going? It's, it's a tension. And so you, you sort of have this very different Form. You have an economic democracy, uh, and democracy can be very good, but it also doesn't necessarily protect environments. So I, I made all of these stories. I sent the paper to, to the reviewers. The reviewers are like, these are great, but you need a chart. You need a table. You can't have a paper without a chart. 
And so they like, okay, I'll make a chart. Um, it was actually very useful um, because uh, it made me sort of think, how do you position these in relation to each other? So I tried to make a chart with the level of growth on one side and then the level of change, the level of institutional stability. And so it's, it's very imprecise, but you can kind of put them in. Um, and in doing so, you can kind of see how they could, how you can have other holes where you could try to fill in. Okay, what would something over here look like? What does that middle area look like? Um, and you can think about how other scenarios could also be created. Um, I also, oh, this keeps popping up. I also then, sort of as a conclusion here, uh, talk about some of the, the methods that can be useful. Um, and, and if you're at all interested in heterodox climate modeling, this is kind of the, the, the big next step, uh, is looking at some of these methods. Um, and, and I guess I'll just call out system dynamics modeling um, as one. So this is a, a type of modeling that focuses on, um, on different connections within the system that lead to feedbacks. So you have feedback loops that drive nonlinearities. Um, and so that's, that's one thing. Uh, and then input-output analysis down here as another one, which is a way to really look at the interconnectedness of the sectors within the economy. And I'm quite sure you're going to have classes on that at some point around here. Um, and so, just to say, I mentioned those, because now I'm going to try to build an energy transition model, which will be a system dynamics model with input-output data analysis. So trying to put those two things together. Um, so just to kind of go through here quickly, this is the framework. This is the, uh, the influence diagram for the model that I've created. And so I start here with final demand. So I have the different sectors in the economy and how much is demanded from those sectors. I then have the productive structure, the technical structure of the economy. So what this is, is asking for each sector, how much, uh, how much inputs do you need from all of the other sectors to make what you're producing? So if you're the construction sector, you need something from the mining sector, you need something from the electricity sector, you need something, uh, maybe a little bit from the education sector, uh, and then a lot from the metals sector, something like that. And there's this big table that, that connects these things together. And so what you're able to do is multiply the final demand by this technical structure to look at the total production in the economy. So whenever you consume something, if you have a notebook, there, there is the things that literally went into this, the paper, the, the plastics, all of this, but there's also the, the products that were consumed in the production of it, the intermediate goods, the intermediate inputs uh, that are not physically here, but were needed to be able to get to this state. So what I'm doing is calculating this total, both the final goods and the intermediate goods. And what you can then do is look at, okay, how much energy was needed to produce all of these goods, uh, the energy intensity of production here, and how much labor was needed. What's the total labor intensities? And so you can have the total energy use from production and the total labor use from production. Separately, I have data about consumption. Uh, so if you have a car, there's the energy needed to produce the car, but then you also use energy when you drive the car. Or when you cook, you also use energy from, from consumption there. So there's, there's different intensities that can relate the level of final demand to the amount of household consumption. You combine that to get your total energy use. Uh, and then you, we have CO2 intensities, and I actually have like a CO2 sub-module uh, that then relates different levels of energy use to different amounts of CO2, uh, and then gives you the amount of emissions. So you're bas it's basically a big calculator that can go from different levels of final demand to different amounts of CO2, uh, which lets you build these different scenarios, which is, which is nice. Um, I have a picture of the model. Um, you can't see much, but I'm very happy to, to talk about system. This is what system dynamics modeling looks like. You have lots of arrows and connections and stocks and flows. That's a, a big corner piece of this. So I'm very happy to talk about that in the future if anyone wants to play with that. Um, the data is not important. Um, just to say, when you build a system dynamics model, what you're building is the structure of the model. That's the real contribution. Um, and then you need some kind of data as a starting point. Um, and then that data gives you sort of, makes your numbers look realistic, um, not just like completely random. And so I've calibrated it with somewhat old data, but someday I can update it and I'm not too worried. Uh, but the, the important things here are that I have 35 sectors, uh, which in my mind is quite a lot. It's quite a fairly detailed sectoral aggregation there, um, and five different energy types. So the energy is broken down into electricity, heat, solid fuels, which is mostly traditional biomass and coal, 
uh, liquid fuels, which is mostly oil, and gases, which is mostly natural gas. Um, and then the last thing just to say is that there's a larger model called Medeas um, that is a very nice model made by uh, ecological economists and post Keynesians working together. And so I, most of the data was taken directly from their model. And if you're interested in that, they're, they're really nice people and mostly in Spain, if you wanna go to Spain and hang out with them. Um, so I have this model and now I have to do something with it. Um, and so I, I first had a, a paper where I tried to pull one lever at a time. So I say, okay, I'm just gonna change final demand and see what happens. Um, and you can kind of trace through how effective is, is final demand. And then I'm gonna change just the technical structure and see what happens. Uh, and you do this sort of lever pulling to see how impactful each of the different policy variables are. Um, but that's boring, so I'm jumping straight to pulling all the levers all at once and trying to build these scenarios where you, where you change these things. Um, and so, the way that I've tried to think through this is saying, I have the five scenarios that I, I outlined in the paper, and I now want to quantify them. And again, the exact numbers aren't the point here. It's not that I'm really trying to predict what's going to happen if we have a revolution, but just to show relative to these other scenarios, how can you think through the, the differences and the trade-offs, really, in some of these stories? Um, so I have these sort of different options for all of the different starting points in the model for technical structure, final demand, energy intensity, labors, renewable, CO2 intensities, and then try to think through in the stories, okay, in this bumpy green boulevard, your final demand level, it's gonna go up really fast and then it's gonna go down, you're gonna have a big recession, but then it's gonna go back up again and then try to build into the model what these paths look like. Your slow and stable street, it's gonna just go down quite steadily. Science fiction wasn't really about growth and so it's probably gonna be more or less the status quo um, but then somewhere else, like your energy intensities are gonna fall dramatically because you've got these great uh, electricity, uh, these great technologies now. Um, and so trying to do all of that and then build into the scenarios. Um, just to check the time. Yeah, no, I'm good. Um, so in the paper, I have the, the sort of full write-up on each of these stories. But just to show the one that I, I kind of have a, an example for, uh, which is slow and stable street. So we're trying to slowly decrease the final demand levels. Um, the energy intensity levels will decrease, especially for consumption. Um, so it's not necessarily a technological change, but people are consuming less energy um, and still having good lives. The labor intensity will go up a little bit. You sort of have a return to low tech in some sectors. Um, renewables will go up, but not dramatically. And this is the big difference with this and sort of the, the Green New Deal scenario. Um, and the CO2 intensity. So the relation between energy use and CO2 stays the same. So there's no magic new technologies, basically. A uh, clean coal, this is like the clean coal variable, and so there's no clean coal in this, this scenario. Um, and so what, what do you see? Um, and so what I have here is a historic growth rate scenario in, in black, where I take the data that I had from 1995 to 2009 and just project it forward and just say, okay, the world's gonna just keep looking the same. Um, and then in pink, I have the, the slow and stable street. And so you have the, the growth rate of final demand, so GDP growth rate, is about 1% and then coming up and converging to 0%. So this is a degrowth scenario at a global level here. Um, and so you have what this turns into is more or less a stable, um, stable and declining level of, of global final demand. Um, this is in, uh, you're still able to have a slight increase in labor use because the sectors that are changing in the demand um, are not equal. So you have a change in the composition of demand and some of the more labor intensive sectors like education say um, are, are increasing, actually increasing while some of the other sectors are decreasing quite quickly. Um, and so that's, that's nice for social stability that this isn't a mass unemployment scenario. This is still has, a, yeah, people are taken care of. Uh, but energy use comes down quite dramatically. Um, you actually are able to have this pretty, pretty substantial decrease in energy use compared to the baseline scenario. Um, so from the CO2 module, yeah, you can see that. You're able to see the, the shift to renewables. So on one side, I have the electricity generation and here the heat generation um, from different types of energy sources. And the big wedge on the top is the renewable energy. Um, and so it is quite a dramatic change. I mean going from almost nothing to, to quite large portions for both heat and electricity. But quite importantly, around the end of the model here in 2030, 
you have a, a stabilization around 60, 70%. So this, this does not get you all the way to net zero. There is kind of a, a balancing here. Um, and that's important because when you translate this to emissions, you do have a decrease in emissions because of the lower demand, but there isn't an energy transition, uh, or at least the energy transition isn't completed. And so you have this, this leveling off of emissions um, at some point, kind of a sharp decline and then leveling off because you didn't change the technological basis uh, of the economy. Um, you can do some fun things looking at the different types of, of, of energy and where this comes from. Um, so you can see it's sort of heat and electricity that are really driving things within this. Um, and the others sort of decline a, a lot quicker. Um, and then if you want, you can also look at decoupling rates. So the, the ratio between economic growth, between GDP growth and emissions. Um, and so this is sort of a big discussion in environmental and ecological economics, um, how much decoupling is possible. Um, and so just to show here on this side, in the, the pink, you have a decoupling rate of about five to six percent per year, um, which is unprecedented. It's very high. Um, it's yeah, quite dramatic for the first years, but then coming back up <laughs> and actually going negative and going up to a positive three percent. And so again, what this really is is that as the amount of renewables in the system flatten out, even with the the, the demand not necessarily growing, you have this sort of rebound of emissions, which is interesting. It's it's not something I would have, if you'd asked me draw the graphs before I like did the modeling, I wouldn't have drawn that. Um, and so that's why we do the modeling. Um, so if I have, yeah, I've got 10 minutes based on the hour I had at the beginning. So I have one more activity. Um, so what I want to do now is to put you back into the groups that you have and say, take the, the, group, the institution that you had before and the, the policies and the scenarios that you tried to use and try to come up with a, a storyline. Um, so what I want you to do, you should have the paper somewhere, I hope, you should have read it, but you should at least have it. Um, and try to select at least one of the concepts, you can select more, but at least one concept relevant to the, the policies that you talked about in the first section. Then try to make a storyline connecting that concept and the policies. So basically explain the graphs that you made and tell this bigger story about what's happening in the world in the world that you created in your model. Um, and then at the end, try to give your uh, scenario a fancy name so we all know what it is. And then if you really want extra credit, try to put it on the, the growth stability chart. Um, but that's, yeah. And if we have like three minutes, we can at least like all say the titles of our stories and then that'll be the end for me. And we'll turn it over to the discussants. So I'll say maybe six minutes will put me right on time, presentations and then discussants. Cool, back at 310. So, it's very precise, right? Do we have any more water? Sink here? Oh, it's fine. <laughs> he understood the, the task. Um, I think I'll try to go to the bathroom, but I'm always afraid of doing that with them.
Kind of go in a circle around. Yeah, I don't know who groups are. But. Uh, just the name. Just the name is What's of Change, and because we want to focus on renew renewable energy. And what's what? What uh, organization were you? Fridays for Future. What? Fridays for Future. Okay, Fridays for Future. <laughs> uh, next behind. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we were the Earphones Alumni Association. Um, and, and that's where our core concept was effective demand. Um, and then also biophysical embeddedness and heterogeneous agents, um, which made us realize that we're essentially the Bumpy Green Boulevard with a little more focus on full employment. But yeah. Perfect. <laughs> and did you have a name? <coughs> No. No, we didn't get to that part. That's the hardest part. In the very back? Um, we're at the city of Paris and we decided to focus on well-being and that's why uh, we called it Green City Good Life. <laughs> In the middle? Um, we were the ruler government. Uh, it was a bit difficult because we're, none of us is an expert in Brazil. Uh, we, in the end, discussed um, Bi biodiversity, uh, power relations, and at least try for well-being. And we also think we would end up a bit in the uh, bumpy green border situation, but we had not figured out a proper catchy title name yet. One front. So we, we would be uh, Biden re-election campaign, um, and so. Uh, the concept of many in uh, institutional embeddedness and uh, path dependency, um, and that kind of put us quite in the middle of the entire thing, a little bit up on the up the institution, yeah, the stability part. Um, we just said good enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Please don't advise the Biden people; they might take that. Uh, up in the front. Yeah. So we are eight life the Latin American Economic Commission uh, from the United from the UN, and we decided to go for social metabolism, legal institutionalism, uh, effective demand, and well-being because we acknowledge that we have like a very like Latin America like has a lot of biodiversity, has the Amazon, has a lot of um, interaction with biodiversity and people, but we need like institutions to make new to make laws. Uh, like taxes and subsidies, uh, reduce inequality because Latin America is the most unequal region in the world. But we also need growth, like a little bit, a bit at least, because there are some countries that are like really demanding some growth or like needs to grow. Uh, so and we need like the well-being to protect the environment in the future. Our third name would be La Calle, La Calle del Buen Vivir Sustentable. Sounds like Sounds like Clark. Yeah, sounds like Clark, right? Exactly. No? We're yeah. in character. Yeah, we're in character. Perfect. And we would, we, we think that we would be like in the um, low, like low growth and institutional change position. I think in the back here, just trying to make sure I don't miss anyone. Yeah, please stand. Um, I, we call this stability for the workers. <laughs> so we uh, thought about power relationships and uh, well-being of our workers. So we were a bit torn between, on one hand, wanting them to have jobs, and on the other hand, to overhaul the whole system. We like we were a bit like, yeah, split between institutional stability full on and institutional change full on. So somewhere. And you were the French trade unionists. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> Perfect. Which is, um, yeah, just whoever is next, it's hard to tell them. We were, uh, okay. we, we were OPEC. And <laughs> the good guys. Or, or, or uh, the uh, no, no, I mean, his name for the thing is uh, uh, ecological oil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and were there any concepts in particular you the, focused the, on? Creative destruction because we use a lot of uh, I don't know carbon capture to deal with uh, the use of oil. Uh. <laughs> to we reach two so, degrees. I, I see a two degrees. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's excellent. I saw four point seven at some point from your group. So <laughs> quite a change. But we made it. When you do everything done for the rest, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we went for the population. Oh. <laughs> oh. Okay, a uh, couple more. Uh, whoever's on board. No, automatically. So. <laughs> yeah, we are European Commission. Yes. Yes, uh, and uh, the name of the story is uh, Grow by Dean Green. A <laughs> European dream. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, and we are focusing on the school of thought that is uh, ecological uh, 
biophysical indebtedness because uh, we believe uh, of using bioenergy and uh, putting some prices for carbon emission and also using renewable energies. And also we believe in afforestation and reducing deforestation. And also on the that side, we want to be in the bumpy green uh, Hearing that a lot, I, I see why I thought that was the most common for where we are in the world. A lot of people thought so too. I think two more. Yeah, uh, we are the European uh, Natural Preservation Society, <laughs> and our path is called Back to Garden Eden. <laughs> and the idea is we, we focus a lot on biophysical embeddedness, so we put a, a lot of hard rules on what kind of ecological damage is not accepted anymore. Basically, all ecological damage <laughs> is not accepted anymore. We also think about power structure a little bit because we give out a lot of uh, rights to the minority, so everyone that is a little bit bothered by any policy gets to overturn them, uh, as long as it's still ecologically friendly. And I think on the graph, we would probably go full on degrowth. And there's also a bit of institutional change. <laughs> Was there one more group in the front? Yeah. Yes. We are the con uh, country roads take me home. We were the European Farmers Association. <laughs> <laughs> and our two concepts are effective demand and rent theory from Marxist and Zrakian perspectives, oh. which is like <laughs> um, Because our idea is to make everyone go back to the farm, the forest, as much as possible, increase crop production, uh, and make the cities lab laboratories for, for carbon capture so everyone can have a horse and a farm. That sounds lovely. <laughs> uh, you're from Texas. <laughs> I'm from Texas. Did, did I miss any groups? You're running a big land use problem. Perfect. Well, that's that's all for me. Thank you, and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. I think after, I think they do the discussion. I don't know, I think so Because we also want horses that have
some topics. We're mostly gonna feed on giving you food for thought and things to discuss on the things that he has presented. So I think that's why they would want to click ah that's why. Alright. So yeah for a motivation on things he wanted to avoid is get the planet destroyed. Uh, but let's go to the summary of the paper. So as he talked he talked about a bit of um, Things that climate modelers are uneasy with IM modeling, um, and he describes a bit in the paper. And the people from IPCC, as he described, put some four uh, critiques. So one of them is no institutional state, there's no alternative, there's only the alternative we are selling this neoclassical world. And then he gives us some conceptual contributions that we already saw, this is small, very list. And this also talks about some methodological contributions on different methods that heterodox economics have learned to masters over the past years. Oh, sorry. And then, as he did, we saw it together, we did together the new narratives that can be created with these concepts and methods. And I think the narratives are the most interesting part uh, that we want to discuss in our now. So I'll pass the word first to see what I imagine. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Um, so we first uh, thought that it would be nice to highlight what the, we thought the paper got uh, really well. Um, this, these are the main uh, points in which Christopher uh, identifies some uh, flaws in the, in the current uh, models, in the great asset models. For example, the first one is uh, these kind of fantastical features that are foregrounded in the models, uh, uh, say the development and availability of certain technologies. Uh, recently, the most scenarios are taking uh, a big, uh, are giving, giving a big role to carbon dioxide uh, technologies, uh, carbon dioxide reduction technologies, such as carbon capture and storage, and uh, uh, afforestation. Uh, to account for the future reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And the, the other one was the opacity model choice uh, and the reasons behind this. Uh, this is important because when we think about the, the scenarios, uh, the outcomes of the scenarios, the pathways that uh, come out come from the modeling, uh, one really asks if this come from the empirics or are actually influenced by the particular choice of certain uh, uh, calibrations or model structures. Uh, then, 
the possibility of uh, unaccounted uh, social, institutional, and political changes in the models, uh, as Christopher pointed out uh, earlier. Um, uh, how is it that uh, you only model uh, certain uh, technological changes, but not uh, the possibility of a different economy, right? Of different ways in which we can organize production and distribution of the uh, of goods and services. Um, this is also coupled with the, with the next one, which is the narrow policy options, considering the models. And well, this all invites to the readers and also researchers to explore more into how heterodox ideas can uh, contribute to expanding you know, the, the, the scope of the model. Uh, then um, we wanted to uh, maybe uh, high, uh, make a suggestion or a, an extension of uh, the reasons behind uh, why the models uh, uh, have these flaws, I mean the reasons behind these flaws, and uh, I think, we think that the reasons behind these are the particular ontology and epistemology in which they are uh, based. Uh, if we think, uh, as some of us have been uh, reviewing earlier in, uh, in another class, uh, epistemology is the reasoning about knowledge, uh, pre uh, more precisely, how is knowledge created? Or, uh, how do, how, do, how do we acquire knowledge? And the first question, uh, the question before this is what exists? We need to determine what exists. And then we can ask the question, how do we know that thing that uh, exists? In the case of neoclassicals, uh, uh, this is uh, the, reason, the fundamental reason for the flaws of it is because their ontology is this closed system of exchange, exchange of uh, money uh, and goods and services uh, in a void. So there is no uh, inputs and outputs of energy and materials in this system. It's basically isolated from any real uh, strata, real world. On the other hand, we have the ecological economics ontology, which is a rather of a, mer a, ra uh, a one of emergence, which is uh, accounted for in the in Christopher's paper in the concept of. Uh, so, uh, phys biophysical embeddedness as a concept in the in the whole matrix that uh, is in the paper, uh, but now we can see why ecological economics have this co have this concept. It stems from this uh, particular ontological uh, conception of the reality. Uh, neoclassicals could never come to this thing because they believe in this. This is their commitment. They are committed to a world in which. Uh, money, and that's the way they get to know the world, what exists for them is exchanges, and that's it, the market. And the way you get to know them is quantifying, putting prices and quantifying everything in terms of money. That's why you do environmental valuation to account for the um, uh, degradation of ecosystems, right? They have no other way to actually assess whether an ecosystem is degrading or not. Uh, finally, we wanted to, I want to put this uh, quote, uh, quote from a recent paper, or relatively recent, which is basically uh, economic, uh, neoclassical economic theory, which is uh, the one that is most used in uh, integrated assessment models, employ a, a linear and reductionist understanding of societal change that is ultimately constrained by the cost-optimizing nature of the model and its inbuilt objective to avoid mitigation actions that would be financially disruptive. Um, thinking about this, I mean, uh, that's the reason why they only conceive of technological change as the <coughs> path to go. Because technological change is going to promote business. You know? It's going to um, be good for the, let's say, overall revenues. Um, yeah. Um, and then coming, coming to um, the, the hard piece of this paper, which are these climate economy pathways, which he used, uh, which he builds, based on the concept. Uh, what I liked right from the start, or what we really appreciated, was this uh, equation of models uh, that they are narratives. And uh, when you think about it, they are actually nothing else than uh, a device for creating narratives. And uh, that was very interesting to think about also heterodox uh, models in that way. Like, which narratives can they provide? Like a Kaletskin model, a Strapping model, which is the story we can tell with it, actually? 
so like he explores some alternatives to these uh, SSPs, as he just said, uh, which are defined by the IPCC. And so he draws up the possibility space uh, between growth and uh, stability change. Uh, and I'll go a bit uh, more into detail uh, what I mean when I say, or when we write, uh, that it's somewhat unclearly defined and contradictory, um, the, um, the pathways he opens up. Um, it's nice to think about them, but they're, they're like uh, some things we have to like look at a bit more closely. And uh, yeah, right from the beginning, um, there's also like no explicit scenarios for peripheral countries versus like already developed countries. So um, that was something that was uh, missing for us. So starting with the Bumpy Green Boulevard, okay, we've talked about this a lot, this is the green uh, growth scenario. Uh, what Christopher does here is to focus on the input constraints to con continue global growth. And what we were wondering was why he does not account for climate damages when talking about Bumpy Green growth while uh, he criticizes it elsewhere <coughs> in the paper that uh, neoclassical economists do not think enough about climate damages, he does not consider uh, climate damages in this um, scenario. Uh, that's a slow and stable street, I don't have much to say about it because this is like the standard degrowth scenario and there are a lot of uh, like models and calculations behind and it's interesting to think about, okay, like if you with an existing IAM model, with the existing uh, module, like if you want to do zero growth you have no idea what's going to happen to the financial sector, uh, and that's where heterodox models can uh, really help out. That's a well taken point. Then, in the science fiction freeway, uh, uh, it's also interesting to think about okay, which technological pathways can and should be, uh, can we pursue and should be pursued? Uh, just uh, begs the question how can future innovation be modeled? Because it's, it, it's in the definition of innovation it's that it's unknowable when it will come up. It's literally like something new that happens and it's very difficult to find out when and where and especially like with, with which specific technologies this innovation is supposed to happen. So I wasn't all too sure how, to, um, how that is going to be done. Uh, then we have the path to perdition which is like the low growth institutional change scenario which is kind of the catastrophe worst case scenario uh, and, and then the question was how, uh, how can we model like social institutional breakdown following climate impacts and this he also admits it's mostly a speculative exercise like may, maybe opening up the space to think about it but there's like no models there, 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 there is none. So it's just like a yeah, speculative <coughs> exercise and uh, it is, um, yeah, a bit, uh, will, have, uh, will have to be elaborated further in further work, I guess. Um, which is also the same for the revolution. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the point is, is kind of obvious. Of course, like changes in the, also the technological structure of society as it happened with the industrial revolution, first with coal, then with oil. Now when we're going over to solar panel uh, power, that will also uh, definitely change um, the way society is structured and will probably lead to upheaval and revolution, that's clear. But how, how, how do we model the possibility of fundamental political change because like the extent of knowledge of what's going to happen is very, uh, you, you cannot know it, right? And, and uh, you talk, for example, about being able to define two different uh, systems of the, uh, like, um, uh, yeah, state systems uh, with tipping points between the two. But I, uh, or we would contend that the other system in which the uh, society tips over is uh, fundamentally unknowable. So it's not only about knowing how var variables would change, but like which variables which will be there after the revolution, which are um, relevant. So like the whole parameter space changes itself. That's the, that's what's, uh, what we think is difficult to do with like the fundamental uncertainty of uh, political upheaval and yeah, uh, very, very fundamental change. So, uh, to sum up, it's a very interesting first step in opening up new narratives of socio-economic pathways. Um, the question is for us, like this possibility space now, is it more clarifying or, or obfuscating? Because for, for us it was not clear why, for example, the path to perdition is in low growth, but the Bumpy Green Boulevard uh, is, is much less catastrophical, although it's like in the high growth. So that, that didn't make so much sense for us. Um, and it's a partly, a, it's completely a speculative exercise, especially Rue de Révolution, Path to Perdition, have like no models which are referenced, so uh, there, there was no 
it, it's opening up the space to think about it for sure, but uh, we, we have no, like, it, um, it would be nice to have like more concrete examples to what he's talking about. Um, and then uh, sometimes it felt as if, uh, you, you mentioned this later in the, in, in the paper, which is well taken, is, is that uh, there's a trade-off between realism and complexity. Like if, uh, it, it just seemed as if like modeling so many different layers of like um, political, social, economic change within a model, uh, you don't justify where this optimism, being able to model it, comes from. Like how, how uh, especially because their reference to existing models are missing. So we didn't really understand um, <coughs> that where the optimism comes from to be able to model all of this. Uh, we didn't uh, really understand that. But um, as we said, like very very interesting uh, step in, in like uh, like uh, uh, for further work down down this road, like to, to, to find out okay how do we actually build uh, new models, new narratives, which can then explore this whole uh, possibility space, which you opened up, which we found uh, very good. Right, um, and now for the final part, we reading the paper, we also had. No, we don't write that yeah, I <laughs> Uh, we also uh, thought of ourselves, are we late to the party when it comes to climate change modeling? Because all of these exciting ideas, and why are we not there sitting together and building those things already? So this is, I think, a, a thing for all of us to reflect upon on how can we be more policy relevant. And I give here some questions, some answers that I think is, is good for, for discussion, because I think what Christopher did is like, really show that we have the tools to do more, and it's a really important work, but why haven't we done it, and what should we do to be more relevant or for them to listen to us? And the other one point we had is, is also in the paper, um, oh, you have to go like that. Okay. Uh, is, 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 uh, there was a bit of missing context here, like why are we talking about this now? Like why are heterodox models not already being considered? Like. Uh, because we, we all know, okay, there was this Club of Rome study in 1972, but uh, another approach won out. But there's like the context missing why heterodox models are not being used already, like what happened in between. It's not as if there were no ideas, but apparently they're not being used and something happened in between. Or is it maybe also heterodox scholars who are completely uninterested in this topic? So there was also like some historical context missing why this has not been happening. Thanks. All right. And one thing that probably maybe explains why we're not very listened sometimes is that we have no unified stories. So the good thing about dice models is that it gives you a simple policy. I find it kind of right to do a carbon tax, then you're solving the problem. And heterodox economists generally have a bundle of policies that are very different and do not necessarily agree uh, on each other. So we don't have, for example, I think one work for the future uh, is to like find which policy space we can suggest from those concepts we have as the heterodox economists. Uh, the second one is maybe the people we're talking to don't have the capacity anymore to follow those policies that are uh, come from the models or the modeling <coughs> scenarios you have. So I, I so here for example we are very skeptical sometimes of market centered <coughs> ideas to solve climate change. And there's also some fun things about how the state agents and bureaucrats, especially in, uh, outside of uh, East Asia, have lost the capacity, the state capacity, to enact big policies and big changes. So we, we can show them the stories, but we show to them, and can they do, go it further? Can they do it? That's a thing we also can think about. And the last thing I want to ask is, who are we modeling for? So. Each model has an audience, and I wondering is I, for example, we, uh, Christopher mentioned the field of revolution, but who is it for? I, for example, if capitalism is incompatible with it, with net zero carbon emission, then what should we do? Should we wear the hat of the economist militant or not? So these are some uh, of, the, of the questions I think that would be very nice for discussion. And I really want to reemphasize how the paper by Christopher really fertilizes the discussion, makes it think. And I'd like to hear to quote uh, Mark Fisher, who wrote about realism capitalism, that sometimes it's easier to imagine the, the end of the world uh, uh, than the end of capitalism, or end the, I don't know, carbon emitted centralized capitalism. What it allows to think is think of different scenarios and think them with the tools that have been collected, constructed in the last years in heterodox economics. 
So thank you very much. I guess I can stay. Okay. Is the mic okay? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, mic. But the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got it muted. Yeah. Okay. So. You didn't end on a whole bunch of questions like the discussants usually do, so I have to like, go through all of the, the different critiques, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, I, I guess maybe just to, to respond on a couple of different things. Um, so I, I think maybe part of it is sort of starting with what I was trying to do by making these scenarios. Um, and I think you, you did capture quite well of sort of who is my audience. Um, and my, my real audience was heterodox economists. That I'm trying to say to heterodox economists, we have these interesting tools, uh, and there are these climate models that are quite policy relevant, and this is a way for us to make our work more policy relevant by trying to latch onto these tools. Um, and so part of the, the kind of showing what you can do with the different scenarios was trying almost an advertising to the heterodox community um, that there is this big, important climate topic, uh, and, and that there are, at least in my mind, somewhat accessible ways for, for them to be able to get into this, this question. Um, and, and so I think on any of the specifics of the scenarios, um, for anyone who hasn't read the paper, I, I will note that the descriptions of each scenario is about four sentences long. Um, and so it really, I had considered like trying to write like big science fiction, like uh, proper pages about like describing these things in more detail. What is life like in these worlds? Um, and in the end, from basically paper constraints, uh, I just had like these very short paragraphs. So I really tried to pull out the most important elements that distinguish the scenarios from each other. So for something like Green New Deal, like yes, there are climate damages, but there's climate damages in any scenario going forward from here. Um, and, and so it wasn't something I really wanted to focus on. Um, maybe I guess one other specific thing on the climate scenarios themselves, on the, the role of the path to perdition, so the, the sort of failure scenario. Um, one thing that I think is always curious in these climate models, um, first, most of the models don't have climate damages, even as of the most recent uh, IPCC 2023 report, um, that it, there is not a feedback from the, the level of carbon emissions or the, the, the degrees of warming to economic activity. It's something everyone sort of acknowledges that we need to do and is trying to work on, but as of 2023, it had not happened for any of the global scenarios. Um, and, and so you have this very curious problem in any of the scenarios that the people in the models are doing these crazy mitigation schemes that are very costly, they're destroying their economy so they can get rid of climate change, but why? Like, there's no problem with climate change. There's, there's no, lack, there's no uh, yeah, damage or um, harm that comes to them if they don't do this. So the, the logic of the models is quite strange. Um, and so what I was sort of trying to think of with this path to perdition was, what if you build in a, a different element of the model that you say, OK, you don't want to do your climate change mitigation. That's fine, your choice. But at some point, you'll switch onto this other path. And it's a very nasty path. Um, and so then at least within the internal logic of the scenarios, you can sort of have a, um, a reason that they're doing the things that they're doing in the, the good scenarios. Um, so that, that was kind of part of the logic behind that as well. Um, I think there, there's sort of a, a bigger question here between uh, the distinction between modeling something and projecting something. Um, and I think that this is where I'm very explicit or, or yeah, very clear in my own head that what we're doing is not projecting. We are not trying to say what we think will happen in the world, but trying to say what are different possible, what are plausible realities, plausible futures. Uh, and that word plausible is sort of the thing doing a lot of work. Um, because sort of what is plausible? That's our, our job as, as scientists again to try to figure it out. Um, and, and so I think that this is this question on unjustified optimism. Where does this optimism come from? Um, for some of these scenarios, and really for the project of modeling more generally, right? Of like, why do I think that we can, why do I think we even should try to model some of these crazy possibilities? And I would say the optimism comes from this policy question. Um, it comes from the existing models that are wildly optimistic. 
Um, and so the, we've mentioned the shared socioeconomic pathways a few times. Um, in one of them, the fifth shared socioeconomic pathway, which is taking the highway, uh, where we, we just really don't worry about climate change and we all get super rich burning all the fossil fuels. Uh, at the end of this scenario, in 20, 2100, the average in, median income for the world is $140,000 per person. Um, uh, no, exactly. And so this is the real climate modeling we're doing. And like, that's plausible. Sure, it could happen. I don't think it's going to happen. And I certainly don't think it's going to happen without a change of economic structure. Uh, of like saying we're just going to keep the exact same system and like we're going to have this wild <laughs> convergence. Um, but like that is the thing that is being published and used and, and really going. And so I don't see any reason why we as, as heterodox economists shouldn't take some of that bravado and say like, yeah, okay, of course there's uncertainties. Of course we don't know exactly what a revolution would look like, but it's a research question, right? You say, what are the different possibilities? What are, what are the different spaces you can map? What are the dimensions? Um, and through that and working with lots of people, working together, we can start to try to map out what these, these things can look like. Um, and, and then just to conclude, I guess, I, I think you really, really hit the nail on the head of who is the audience for all of this. Um, and I certainly don't have uh, an easy answer to that. I think it's a question you should ask for any economics that you're doing, sort of what is the, the plausible audience, and then you can have different answers to that. Um, but I think that in this climate modeling space, it's been really interesting. It's important to know how influential the models are in very detailed things, like climate negotiations. Um, so when the, the countries come together and say, we're going to reduce our emissions by this much, and this means your country has to do that much, they're using these models, these climate economy models, to try to see who's going to do what. Um, and so like, there's kind of a first like, very practical thing. Um, and then the, so the idea of why do we have to have net zero by 2050, again, comes from climate models. Our targets, our policies, really all of the big picture stuff um, on one hand, and then the policy effectiveness on the other hand. Um, so we've kind of mentioned carbon taxes a handful of times, but carbon tax is really the, the, the almost the exclusive policy that is modeled in most of these. And, and it, honestly, it's not even modeled as a policy, but as a shadow price, um, because like the actual implementation of a carbon tax is its own policy with an interesting dynamics. But that's not what we're doing. We're saying, what if there was a price on carbon, um, which is subtly different um, and sort of even more one step removed from reality. Um, so again, just by showing these different things, and I think this is where there is a lot of work, especially in the ecological macroeconomics literature, which is a lot of ecologicals and post-Keynesians at this point working together mostly, um, to really get into some of the, the policy details of what these different policies could be, working time reductions, different, um, uh, different financial uh, uh, central banking arrangements. There's a whole post-Keynesian literature on that. Different green central banking, how effective can this be? What can, what can it contribute? Um, so yeah, I, I think that that is the question. What policymakers, what civil society um, elements can we be useful to? Um, and, and I think a kind of a final note of here, or a pitch of where I would like us to go, or like myself to go, is also thinking about uh, state, local, regional city actors. Um, because yes, we all want to like go and influence the president of the United States, but there's a lot of constraints, and it's not clear how much they can do. Um, but at a local level, or a city, or a regional level, I think there's a lot more space. And there's just so many regions that some of them somewhere want to do interesting things. And, and so I think there's a lot, of, a lot of usefulness for making our models broad enough and, and sort of generalizable enough that they can be used in different contexts. Which, of course, you sacrifice some specificity, but that's something I think is really interesting in a place especially with EPOG, where you have people from all over the world that we can go and then um, have some impact in the places that are politically interested in, in doing things that we're also politically interested in. So I think that's all I'll say for now, and then I imagine we have a lot of questions. Yeah. So, questions? Then also your name and your country, so that's a nose. Yeah, I think I'll take the, the table back, though. Okay. Uh, so the first question. Uh, sorry, Julio, my ticket. Uh, so the first question, like the only question that I have, it's I kind of like didn't understand like your day, like your cross table, no. and why you put like <coughs> the path of perdition on the like low, low growth mm -hmm. and institutional change, uh, because. I didn't understand correctly. 
would it, or like driving through it, and why did you put like the bump into like yeah the yeah. Uh, institutional uh, stability and growth because if I understood correctly like it would imply like like the part of uh, prediction implies that there is no transition to towards green energy right then yeah, yeah. that permits institutional stability no? um, should I answer one at a time quickly or we take three questions yep. uh, okay. and then uh, we answer yeah. <coughs> yeah, but, okay. I'm gonna set Hi, um, Caroline from Germany. Um, I have a question because you said your aim was to make heterodox models, ecological models, more policy relevant. So for heterodox economists to be able to engage with policymakers, but I feel like with these models, you're adding so much complexity and so many different narratives that it's actually, or I, I would imagine it becomes extremely difficult to say to a policymaker what they should actually be doing and there's also the danger of sort of the policymakers nitpicking the kind of narrative that would be useful to whatever their goal might be. So have you thought about yeah how to communicate all these different narratives and all this complexity to the people that actually end up making the decisions? Yeah, Nina from the UK. Um, so when looking at climate models and stuff like that, oftentimes I've found uh, those firstly uncertainty, but also ethical dilemmas, including like the distributional effects and also discounting factors, uh, which can kind of disillusion, I think, I guess, the population from these models. And how can you like? Is there any way, particularly in any specific models? Uh, that you could recommend that are better at overcoming these ethical dilemmas that can occur in, for example, IMS models. Okay, I'll do three at a time. Go, I guess, back to the beginning. So on the, the specific placement on the chart, um, the idea was that I was charting the results of the scenarios. And so in the path to perdition, you have a collapse of society, basically, um, which in my head would be a low growth scenario, not by plan, but by disaster, um, that your economy basically breaks down. Um, and so then also in my head, that's like a very high level of institutional change because the institutions are collapsing. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how I, I think I have that mapped there. Um, and that for the, the, the bumpy green boulevard, it was sort of a scenario attempting to have a very high growth rate where you were really targeting high growth rates. And yes, you run into problems, but eventually they, they sort of get through them. And so compared to the other scenarios, it was the, the most Keynesian high growth um, yeah, scenario. But I, I think I would say I'm not sort of, the, the kind of placing them in the space was sort of not the main exercise. It was sort of a, a way to like put them all in one, you know? Can I something? Possibly. I'm not the moderator, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like the thing is that, uh, like I think, like if you add it like into a two D yeah. chart, then it misses like I don't know, like for example the ecological part. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. For example, on the part of prediction, like it's like from from my understanding, it's also like quite <coughs> the best for the ecological transition actually, isn't it? Like the the most like it's like for example what would happen like. If the COVID trend would follow, like of course, like it's horrible no. for the economy as we understand it. No, I, mean, I, I would say it's more like the Thanos snap. Like, sure, you can you can solve some of your ecological problems, but at what cost? And like that is not at all an, a thing that we want in my head. Um, but but yeah, there's other okay. ways you can map these things. But the idea was just to show how they can be created. Okay. okay. Um, for the complexity for policymakers, I I think that this okay. is both a challenge and an opportunity because of how complicated the existing mainstream IAMs are, that I think this is really a place where the entire climate modeling community struggles right now um, in linking specific policies with outcomes. Um, and, and so, I, yes, it is definitely an issue that we have to deal with in building our models, but it, I, I think that there's 
Um, there's a lot of benefits of smaller models in some sense, and models that really focus on a couple of things at once. Um, so I, I think a lot of modeling groups take their task to be describe every system in the world, every natural and social system, like try to model that and put it all together. Um, and that's fun, but it, it, it makes it very difficult then to say like, oh, if you do this, like, what's going to happen? Um, whereas I, I, I would um, point to the Eurogreen model, um, which was actually developed by a group in the University of Pisa, a bunch of post Keynesians, with funding from the European Green Party originally. Now it's kind of its own thing. Um, and it was very specific on what is the impact of working time reduction on, on uh, yeah, the Green Party stuff. And so they sort of built a small system dynamics model. You can look at it. It's like if someone sits down with you for an hour, you can explain how it works. Like, it's sort of, yeah, more manageable. And so, or the Medeus one that I mentioned, so this was very specific about the problem of what happens if and when we run out of energy availability. Um, so if there's not enough renewable energy, oil or coal, um, currently like enough uh, capacity for using that. Um, and, and so it was like really like a peak oil scenario in some sense, um, sort of an older 1970s worry of we're gonna run out of oil. Um, and so that it's again a very specific problem that some policymakers can be interested in, and then you you kind of build a model to show that problem. So I think that that's that's a lot more, yeah, a lot easier to conceptualize of how do you say like take a, a research question and build a model for it, um, as opposed to build a model that explains everything and then try to apply it to everything. Um, on the ethical dilemmas, um, so I think one distinction I didn't make here that is actually really important is between process-based IAMs and optimal growth IAMs. Um, and I described this a little bit in the paper, but originally the, the phrase integrated assessment model um, was used by William Nordhaus to refer to his DICE model. Um, and so what this model does is it tries to estimate the optimal level of global warming. So on one hand, you have damages, how bad is it going to be? And then the other hand is the cost. How expensive is it to, to do something about it? And then you can somehow balance these, and he decides four degrees was the optimal level of warming. Um, but there's these problems of discounting. How much do you care about future generations? Uh, it's sort of how do you count damages? That's one problem, but my kind of short answer on that entire literature is that the Paris Climate Accords sort of destroyed it, because now we don't care what the economists think the ideal level of warming is. It's two degrees. Like, we have our target, maybe 1.5, but really two degrees. Like, that sort of, and you come in and say, oh, four degrees would actually maximize GDP, and nobody cares anymore. It's sort of, that, that research question has died. Um, and so for the process-based IAMs, there's still definitely ethical things in there, but at least this big discount rate thing is less prominent, um, because it's more of a cause and effect question of, if we do this, if we have a, a carbon tax of this level, what are the impacts? And so the, the research question has changed from, what is the best response to climate change, to how do we achieve this specific climate goal. And then you can change what your climate goal is and do have different scenarios, but at least for as on an ethical level, I think what they're doing now is <laughs> much better than what it was five, 10 years ago. More questions? Uh, yes, I'm James from Uganda. And uh, I think uh, the model that you're doing is quite sophisticated. And uh, my, my question would be, have you considered, I think also the discussants alluded to this, whether you've considered the peripheral countries and more developing and emerging market economies, whether this kind of model can actually be adapted to, to it. Because I think uh, my reading of it is that it's uh, more for the developed economies, and yet uh, the climate uh, crisis is actually very detrimental for uh, countries in the global south, and yeah, so I think it's an important issue. Okay. Um, Pava from Austria. Um, I actually have a question because I, I'm not sure, maybe maybe it's already in there, but I had the feeling like on the lower left quadrant it was a rather negative picture that was painted. I was wondering if there's also, if you could also imagine a scenario where you have low growth, degrowth, growth, uh, but also a lot of institutional change, like for example, if you had like uh, uh, solidarity economies or commons, or if you also consider something. Um, yeah, um, my question is actually related to James's because um, I also felt that a model like this is more suited to looking at developed economies, typically the first world economies, um, because um, 
aid the pattern of growth that uh, non-first world economies are experiencing is not the same as um, the first world economies. Um, and also, uh, there's an increasing focus on the discourse about uh, differential responsibilities for common uh, outcomes, uh, which kind of takes the burden away on a large part from countries which are still developing. And I'm not sure if something like that gets figured into a model like this when you're looking at, you know, projections for the future or, or the possible scenarios which could come up in different countries because the US and India, for example, will not be functioning the same way, even if the scenario is the same in both countries. Um, so what do you think of so I guess to, to speak to the developing issues first, I think my answer would be that climate modeling absolutely can be applied, um, climate economy modeling, um, and that it, it is being applied quite, quite actively. I think where I struggle the most is applying heterodox economics and specifically post-Keynesian economics to developing countries. Um, and I think this is sort of what's reflected most in the, the sort of, in the storylines that I, I have. And, and it, it's not that it's not possible, it's just it's more complicated in some sense. That you, there's more things that you have to deal with and you kind of, you can't, you, it's harder to have these kind of big sweeping things of like effective demand um, that you kind of then like, okay, but, and then there's other, other development challenges. So I, I, I imagine there's a kind of a lot of thoughts in this room, but at least for the, the kind of things that I was taught in EPOG and the, the kind of heterodox economics that I, I learned in Europe, um, it, it was, I didn't feel super confident, and I still don't in some senses, directly applying that in the developing <coughs> context as much as I feel confident applying it to Europe and the US. Um, and I know that there's sort of entirely different literatures, especially in Latin America, that are, are much more suited for that. Um, but on specifically the, the practice of climate economy modeling, um, there is work being done on country-specific models, um, and there's a couple of different groups doing this. And I know the, the French Development Agency, who I think you'll meet with at some point, they, they have a handful of different country-based, country-specific models, um, and from a post-Keynesian perspective as well. And I don't know the specifics on that, but I know that it's, it's something happening. Um, maybe just one last point on, on sort of the I guess as well, this global justice question. Again, it comes to your research question. And if your research question is about climate mitigation, how do we reduce the emissions we currently have, then suddenly large parts of the developing world aren't so relevant to the current problem. Uh, so was it Africa, the entire continent emits like 6% of our carbon emissions? So it, it, when you're really looking at these models, a lot of what the task they're trying to project is how does Europe, US, and uh, in China, sort of very quickly reduce emissions, and the rest of the world is able to develop in a way where they don't dramatically increase emissions. Let me so. interrupt you there, but India is very often the focus of debates like these because China and India are clubbed together more often than not, even though I don't agree with it. Uh, because um, also another heterodox thing to do is to look at carbon emissions not from a production but a consumption yeah. perspective. And if you look at carbon emissions in India and China, they produce a lot, but most of it is consumed in the US and in Europe. So uh, making the argument sound more, uh, putting more responsibility on India and China is also sort of a justice question in, uh, in mitigation questions like this. I, yeah, I, I guess I, we don't have time to get totally sucked into this, but just to, to keep saying, to think about what the research question is for the model, and if your research question is how do we have net zero emissions by 2050, how do we reach the two degree Paris goals, um, then suddenly what you're looking at is how do we reduce emissions in the, the, the global north and how do we deal with emissions coming from China? Um, and like, yes, they're coming from production, usually that is shipped to other places, but like that's a thing we have to deal with. Um, and, and so like there's, you can kind of add layers of justice, add different, um, there's interesting scenario work as well doing survey data about different global justice scenarios and having people kind of design how they think, what they think would be fair, because there's, there's sort of different shades of how you can, how you can think about this and then trying to apply that to different IAMs. So it is a very active research community, but again, it's sort of what is your research question and what is your scope? 
um, which, is, which is kind of difficult. Um, let's see, low growth and institutional change, I have written as the, um, no, yeah, th this was an easy one, but I, I think that this is sort of, um, in some senses, the ideal scenario, right? Um, and where you have both the revolution and the, the degrowth at the same point. Um, and, and again, from what I was doing in this paper, I was trying to focus on one thing at a time. Um, and so specifically in my degrowth scenario, there wasn't a massive energy transition, which like, that's crazy, there should be, like we should do that. Um, but kind of just doing one thing at a time to see, yeah, to see what you need to put together to have this work. Um, and so in one sense, you could combine the revolution and the, the, the slow, slow deal thing, or on the other side, maybe you do the, the slower degrowth scenario with the Keynesian Green New Deal, and that's sort of a different direction that could also be useful and interesting. And, and maybe there's some like different ideas about what is better and what we want to go for, but, but yeah, that was the hope with all the, the modeling and being able to have these discussions in the same, and be able to have these discussions, and then if we really want to, start to put numbers on them and, and actually do some graphs and models and see what the specific requirements would be. So how much degrowth do we need? Um, I had the decoupling rates there of 6%, um, which I, some people, 4% is like a magic number that like is supposed to be impossible to go under that. I don't know the literature so well, but I see 4% a lot. And so I was surprised when I got 6% and that still wasn't really <laughs> helping get emissions down. So things like that, to have like a basic calibration of knowing what we're talking about. I think we had three more questions. Yeah. Um, my question is referring to something you said at the beginning that there is a certain discrepancy between heterodoxy uh, being on the fringes within economics itself on the one hand and heterodox policies showing up in some form or the other in some potentially like even powerful institutions. Would you say that like these institutions just don't really consult like the academic literature and just do what they feel is right, so they basically disregard the scientific discourse, or would you say that something that is on the fringes in the economic literature can still somehow like somehow gets to the policy without being cited a lot or like without becoming dominant in the academic discourse? Your name and country? Sorry? Ah, I'm from Germany. <laughs> and Leo, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm from India, and my question is I have a very fundamental question. I do not still understand this distinction in your pie chart and all the graphs between the energy sector and the industry and agriculture because we are always talking about uh, what happens downstream. So, production, industry releases emissions, and that gets consumed elsewhere. So how are we making the distinction between the sectors? And related to that, if you again take it sector-wise and see, okay, consumptions in the global north contribute to a lot of it, so in the developing world, since we are talking about that, so does, I mean, local energy consumption or electrification in the parts of the world that are now getting electrified, does it have any significant contribution or is it negligible? Okay. You? Maybe, Maybe before? Maybe not. No? Yeah. Yeah. Your name yeah. is? I'm Jan from Colombia. Uh, I, I have a question because I didn't get the difference between, like, you said you wanted to do a little bit, like, introducing the Toros concept and the method you actually ended up to do your model. Because for me, it was actually the same way of building a scenario because I mean, you were like, just playing with technical coefficients, like uh, with the growth, with the if emissions intensity, and at the end, like because in the paper you said, okay, it would be nice to model uh, institutional change, institution, democracy, or legal institutionalism, this kind of stuff. That I'm not sure if it's relevant uh, to modeling models such as complex as this, or if it's even. I mean, if you think that the model should provide answer for these kind of things, because. For instance, you don't need like to model, to model a kind of a war to know that if you don't meet the climate change, maybe you can end up having, having a war like having a war. So my point is like, uh, what's your vision about what a model should do and what kind of answer uh, should provide? Like because modeling these kind of things that are quite complex and even kind of mid model and a bit misleading. Uh, I don't know if it's at the end relevant to model. Okay. Nice. So, 
Mike, you, you mentioned in one of the answers that the Polskian literature could not uh, respond to um, development problems in peripheral countries. I said it made it more complicated. Yeah, but but the, but there is. Uh, Okay, so this is more of a comment, I guess, on that. Uh, but there is like a, 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 at least in like Latin America, like a huge literature on uh, problems of development. Because the scenarios we are dealing here, they are very long, and we are mostly using macroeconomic tools, which sometimes do not translate well to long-term scenarios. And there was a, a lack, uh, I think maybe could add in the future, like on this literature on long-term development that a lot of de developmentalists have developed that would be maybe interesting on adding in the future. Oh, it was a comment. I'm sorry for that, I guess. No, <laughs> that's good. Okay, I'll do some answers. Um, so on heterodox economics and its, its kind of status as both uh, fringe and, and central sometimes, uh, I think my answer would be both, and I'm trying to remember the, the exact question. Um, so in some cases, yes. I, I think that there are institutions like the Bank of England, for instance, um, that as a central bank looks at the world and says, this is how things work. Um, and the way that they describe that is much closer to post-Keynesian economics than it is to neoclassical economics. Um, and so like, I don't know what's more mainstream than the Bank of England, that, that's kind of a question. But it's, but they are like, very serious economists who know all of the different uh, schools of thought and theories, and a, they didn't kind of just come to this by accident, right? Um, it was just like one is much more relevant and clearly correct um, for, for what they're trying to do. Um, but I think that there's also cases, which was sort of the second part of the question, where something like uh, Minsky could be an example. Someone who was very obscure in the mainstream suddenly becomes very mainstream, and all the Nobel Prize people are suddenly talking about Minsky as if he was an old friend and they, they've like been reading him their entire lives. And it's like, okay, well, like, where did that come from? Like, oh, we had a giant financial crash. And suddenly this is more relevant. Um, I think the, the success of the MMT people in the US of at least like kind of becoming popular in some sense, I, policy relevant might be a step too far, but at least like, I, I don't know, they, they gained some traction. And I think that they're, they're sort of things to learn from that as well about different groups having their moments. Um, behavioral economics, I think, is the other one, which we can kind of debate the degree to which that is, is heterodox. Um, but it's at least something different um, from standard mainstream macro. Uh, and, and it has very much had a, a very, in my, in my sense, nasty impact uh, on how governments view the, the role of policy. Um, and that is really had like quite a, yeah, been very <laughs> successful in, in getting them to nudge us in every direction and set up nudge units and then sort of had a whole world. <coughs> So I, I have optimism, at least, that there are conditions in which we lose the academic battle. We're never publishing in the top five journals. And yet, there's still some relevance in the real world. Um, and I think that that's, that's at least kind of a, a hope or a, a world. Let's see. So I had the, the different energy sectors. Um, I'm not <coughs> sure I entirely understood the question, but I, I think the, the answer for at least what I would say that I'm modeling is that I'm looking at energy use in all of its forms. Um, and so whether that energy is used in what we would traditionally call the energy sector or the industrial sector or in agriculture or in consumption, sort of all of the energy used anywhere in any type, that is the scope of what I'm trying to model. Um, and so, yeah. Consumption is not on that pie chart, but agriculture and industry are So what emissions would agriculture and industry where would those emissions come from if not from energy consumption? So why do we even have the second energy is always used in some sector or the uh, other? Okay, so the, the pie chart at the very beginning, this was sources of CO2 emissions. Um, and so you have different types of energy use, um, which some of it was in production and some in consumption. Within energy, there was lots of different divisions. And then there's some from agriculture, which is mostly land use changes, mostly deforestation. Um, and then there's some industrial processes that are unrelated to energy use that still emit CO2. Uh, cement production is the, the biggest one. Um, and then there's some other things that emit CO2. Uh, agriculture also has methane emissions from, from animals. Um, so things like that. Completely non-energy, yeah. Yeah, but the thing that I try to show is like, it's real, it's a big problem, we need to deal with it, but it's a fairly small part of the pie. 
Um, and especially these, the, like we talk about steel so much. How are we going to have carbon-free steel? I don't know. We'll figure it out. But it's a very small part of the pie compared to like not burning coal for electricity. Um, so that's kind of the beginning. Um, uh, the big one, what should a model do? Um, I'm trying to remember where this, this came from this side. Um, I, this has come up in a lot of different forms here. And, and I think that I, I have the same answer that I had from the discussants, that I take my inspiration from the mainstream guys. And anything they think a model should do, I am ready to go there with them, even if it's crazy. Because they're the ones that are winning, and they're the ones that are, are setting policy agendas. Um, and so yeah, it's kind of like ridiculous from an academic perspective what we're trying to do. Um, what, uh, we actually had a, an event in Pisa with a bunch of climate modelers, and this was one of the comments of like, eh, is what we're doing science? Eh, I don't know, but it's necessary. Um, and I think that it's kind of like a weird role, a really weird place to be in, because like, am I trying to discover something new about the world? In some sense, yes. Trying to understand different options, different causes and effects. Um, is it super rigorous? No, not really. I mean, we're, we're projecting all kinds of crazy things. Um, but it's just as rigorous as what the guys at Harvard are doing. Um, and, and they're the ones that are, are informing all of the, the big decisions. And so, yeah, it's kind of uncomfortable, especially if you come from this like very, um, a very good philosophy of science background. If you're worried about ontology and epistemology, like, oh man, this is, it's really like not pleasant stuff that we're playing with. Um, but again, I, I kind of come to this from a very like policy realist side, I guess, of, of saying if they're going to, it's an arms race. If they're going to do it, we have to do it too. Um, yeah. And then just finally, yeah, the problems of development. Um, I, I think this is where I very much just ex like kind of admit that I am very bad on these topics personally. And so it was very difficult for me in trying to write a paper and trying to write a paper quickly. Um, I kind of went with what I knew. And, and so you, you mentioned tropy and economics as well. It's like, I should, I, they should be on the table, but I just don't know well enough how to put them in this table. Um, and, and so I think, again, this, the kind of paper is an invitation. Um, and, and I think especially these questions of development and, and how development fits into this bigger picture. So I keep kind of coming back to this research question of like, within the larger global decarbonization scenarios, how does development play into that? Because right now it's a fairly small amount of emissions, but there's the potential for it to go, expand and go crazy. And so it's kind of that story of how do you develop without having this, these huge negative consequences that, eh, I don't know, I have no idea, but, but I would be excited to see papers and models. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.